Welcome to another Achieve CE live webinar. This course is approved by the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, otherwise known as ACPE. Once you complete this webinar, your course credits will be reported to the CPE monitor and CE broker within 24 to 48 hours, and you will be emailed a certificate. The last few minutes of this webinar will be dedicated to a live question and answer session with the instructor. Please feel free to enter your questions or comments in the chat below during the presentation, and they will be responded to by the instructor at the end. At the end of this webinar, a link to a short online survey will be provided in the chat. Please note that you must complete this survey in order to receive course credit. In case you're new here at Achieve CE, we focus on offering courses on the important trending topics of the day to keep you up to date in your field, while also satisfying your continuing education requirements. Aside from our live webinars, we also offer on-demand text and video courses to take at your convenience, all which are available in our membership. We're excited you're here today and hope you enjoy the webinar. With no further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to today's instructor. Welcome everyone to Just Say No, a review of illicit substances. Yep, we'll be going over them all. There's going to be a lot of different uh, illicit substances or substances of abuse uh, that we'll be covering and overall trends uh, and information that we really need to know as healthcare professionals to best help our patients. But first, of course, uh, anyone and everyone would want to know a little bit about the person with the mic, right? Uh, so my name is Mark Arofli. I'm a, a clinical assistant professor in experiential learning for uh, our WVU School of Pharmacy. Uh, and also a faculty member in our WVU School of Medicine Pain Fellowship Program, uh, and of course a clinical pain management pharmacist at our WVU Medicine Center for Integrative Pain Management. Uh, so back in the day, I got my PharmD from Pitt, so yes, uh, walking backyard brawl per se, um, and then uh, I got an MBA from Strayer University as well. Uh, board certified in geriatric care, and uh, certified pain educator, and also a certified tobacco treatment specialist. Uh, I started out my pharmacy career uh, with CVS Health uh, and then uh, moved onward to Humana Healthcare uh, and then landed uh, with uh, WVU, West Virginia University School of Pharmacy. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, blessings in, in my professional career to work on uh, programs such as the Safe and Effective Management of Pain uh, program and also our state pain management guidelines. I've uh, had the opportunity to consult as a CDC grant reviewer, a professional journalist reviewer, a civil and criminal expert witness for cases, and currently am the host of the Pain Pod on the Pharmacy Podcast Network uh, with an international audience of a lot of you. Uh, but passions lie, of course, professionally speaking with uh, pain management, uh, substance use disorder, addiction, and patient care and education for healthcare professionals and society alike. Now that's all well and good, but here's a little visual version of this guy. So uh, like I mentioned, walking back here at Brawl, uh, graduated from Pitt uh, and now work at WVU. Uh, also across the pond, way across the pond over in Italy, family has a vineyard. It's the Grofley Vineyard that you're seeing here. And one of our things that we love to do is go fishing with our uh, toddler, uh, Luke, having a little bit of fun there uh, fishing the pond with the fountain because you got to have fun. Now, as far as disclosures, I do have to mention I have no actual or potential conflicts of interest to disclose, uh, and this activity was developed by Achieve CE free of any commercial support. Our learning objectives today for pharmacists will be that pharmacists will be able to recall dozens of common substances of abuse based on pharmacological classification, and also to describe the respective pharmacology of common substances of abuse, and finally to recall the DEA controlled substance classes of common substances of abuse. In a very similar fashion, uh, pharmacy technicians will be able to recall dozens of common substances of abuse based on pharmacological classification, and also to describe the respective pharmacology of common substances of abuse, and finally, to also recall the DEA controlled substance classes of common substances of abuse. So let's take a trip back in time here, a little bit over a century ago. Of all the nations of the world, the United States consumes the most habit-forming drugs per capita. That's what our U.S. Opium Commissioner said in 1911. That was Hamilton Wright. So we all need to think about that. This is not new information and, and uh, data and whatnot that we're going through these days. Been around for a while. 
So looking at the epidemiology of our basically our war on drugs or the opioid crisis or you know everything all together, uh, here's the visual map. Uh, everybody can navigate to find where their state stands. You know the darker the color, especially with the green, that's the higher rates. Uh, and this is from 2019 because uh, data is typically about a year and a half lagging, especially with getting nice fancy visuals, of course. And you know we can look at all the numbers and whatnot, but one of the ways that I look at things is that. In our country, uh, prior to the COVID uh, pandemic, I, an American died every seven minutes on average from a drug overdose, not just opioid, but drugs overall. And conversely, on the other side of the coin, a baby was born dependent, not addicted, but dependent on opioids. So both extremes and sides of life there, uh, but things that we really need to keep in mind. Now, during the COVID pandemic, the numbers actually increased for that seven minutes to actually become about six minutes. But that's one year in time, so we're going to see how things go towards the future as well, too. Now, same idea, but different way of looking at things to see how things have escalated overall. You can even go by gender here, but really want to concentrate on the total of how the total U.S. drug overdose deaths have been increasing uh, ever so slightly, but always increasing for decades now. Now, naturally, one of the follow-up questions would be, well, what about which individual illicit substances? Uh, so here we see um, those listed as per the lines here. So obviously what stands out is things like uh, fentanyl and its analogs, uh, the, the you know, synthetic narcotics as labeled here anyway, uh, you know, spiking around 2014, 15, uh, and certainly going up from there. Uh, other things to take note of though, prescription opioids. They were increasing for the first decade of the century and then have kind of plateaued ever since about 2010, maybe 2009, but still are about 15,000 of those 70,000 or so each year. Everyone being a heartbeat, that's still a lot to come on that information later, of course. And then we have heroin and even cocaine on there where these things were always uh, contributing in the background and even things like other prescription products like benzos and antidepressants. So looking at the big picture here, where, where can we go for some uh, interesting information? So here's streetrx.com. Uh, it's just an online website. Uh, they have, it's kind of like a social media trolling of seeing what people are putting online and saying that they paid for various illicit substances across the country. You could type in whatever zip code or state or city or whatever, and you can see things come up on a map. Uh, it's kind of like a Wall Street ticker of the drug market if you will. Um, one way uh, that I would want uh, to, to kind of explain for us healthcare professionals is remembering this is a little bit easier than uh, some more sophisticated resources because at the very bottom of the page for this, uh, there's actually a resource for addiction treatment centers by zip code. Uh, it links to SAMHSA, but a little bit easier way to remember that to help all of us. Now, talking about getting uh, integrated into society, the uh, quote unquote war on drugs and uh, the whole idea is integrated everywhere in society. First up here, we're looking at a couple of books. Now, I could have many, many more slides of this, of course, but here's a few that you might want to check out, uh, of course. Uh, there's uh, Dreamland. I think everyone's heard about Dreamland from Sam. Um, that uh, came out years ago and talked about basically heroin coming from the area of Mexico and meeting generally in Appalachia, where I'm from, uh, of meeting the prescription opioids that were diverted. So many others here to check out if you would like. Uh, Sam's actually, and I'm not tied to any of these books or anything, but uh, Sam's actually got a, the, the newer book um, releasing uh, October 2021. So uh, we'll all be able to read that now. It's called The Least of Us. A couple other ones here to check out there. Bottom left, there's uh, Chasing the Screen by Johan Hari. He actually has a TED Talk. It's about a dozen minutes or so talking a little bit different view of addiction, really. American Pain, that's actually about one of the biggest pin mills, if not the biggest pill mill that we've ever seen down in Florida back in the day, pre-PDMP of note. Uh, Narconomics, by the way, that's an interesting viewpoint from economists, a little bit different outside of healthcare. Uh, killing season, that's something for the view of, a, of an EMT, uh, and so on and so forth here. There's many more folks, but here's a couple just to kind of expand our mind even further. Now, since we're talking about media now, um, for some reason, when a celebrity has a drug overdose or drug overdose death, it seems to resonate more with us. These faces are some of those faces of drug overdose deaths. And naturally tied to celebrities, of course, would be the cinema or TV versions of media where there are there is drug 
uh, utilization integrated into things. Now, some of them that are a little bit more information like Drugs Inc. or even a relatively newer one, Hamilton's Pharmacopeia. Uh, but then we also have, uh, you know, I've learned to ask uh, who hasn't seen Breaking Bad. Um, I know, I know there's some of you out there, uh, but the idea is that the, that's a big one when it comes to meth, of course. We'll go more later, but there's also heroin. Oh, and also Recovery Boys, both of those, uh, along with Oxiana even as well, um, stemming from West Virginia. A lot of wonderful West Virginia, where I'm from. Uh, then we have Narcos talking about South America. Scarface, pretty obvious there, right? What about Lord of the Rings? How'd that get on there? The ring, the ring, the precious cocaine. Heroin? You could put anything in there. It's actually all about addiction in the background. Now, here's here's having uh, perhaps a little bit of nerdy fun, but uh, here's our medicinal melodies. So if we're going to talk about movies and TV, we got to talk about music, too. Ever been in a vehicle driving and all of a sudden you're kind of humming this tune? No, I don't sing. Can't do that. But <laughs> at least in our heads, right? Uh, but these songs here are all talking about drug utilization. And this slide could actually be about eight slides minimum, uh, even at a smaller font. Uh, so all here we can see sometimes things are very straightforward. Um, you know, there was a, a whole bunch here we're including for marijuana utilization, uh, but things like like a G6, the dextromethorphan, uh, that's, you know, flying a G6 is one of those really fast airplanes up in the uh, high in the sky. So getting high um, on robo tripping. Uh, ecstasy, you know, Miley Cyrus, we can't stop, we won't stop tripping on Miley or Molly. Molly, short for molecule for ecstasy, and so on and so forth. I'll let your eyes wander here, of course, but um, the whole point here is that this is integrated into our society, and sometimes we know, but other times we don't really realize it. Now, in viewing uh, illicit substances, we got to look at all angles. So here, here's the uh, next couple topics and slides we're going to be looking at the grouping of illicit substances in different ways. So here is an amazing gentleman, Dr. Kevin McCauley, uh, where he develops this, you know, there's periodic tables out there. You could Google them for darn near anything and everything these days. But here's one for not just illicit substances, but also just anything that could, quite frankly, increase dopamine in the brain of ours. Uh, dopamine goes up when something's better than anticipated. Anything on here can increase dopamine and will. Uh, but it's organized uh, kind of like a regular periodic table here. You got sedatives to the left, top uh, being alcohol, and then stimulants to the right, top being cocaine. And then classifications or groups of these substances are the horizontal rows. You even have the misfit island of nuclear stuff going on there like uh, social media, gambling, sex, food, and so on. Anything that can increase dopamine, thus contributing to substance abuse, uh, substance use disorder, and so forth. Now, of course, another way, and actually one of our learning objectives, of course, here today, but another way of grouping things is by obviously DEA controlled substance classes. So a couple stand out though here. You know, C1s, no medical use, uh, no generally accepted medical use anyway. Uh, heroin, LSD, marijuana, ecstasy, that's methylene dioxy, methamphetamine, or MDMA, uh, and PCP. Couple examples. Now C2s, get this, cocaine, fentanyl, and meth. Did we know that? I'm, I certainly hope we did, but things to consider, of course. C3s, we got special K or ketamine and bup. C4s, of course, benzos and tramadol. And C5s, the big heavy hitter there is promethazine with codeine. But here's another way, obvious, of course, but just to think of things here and kind of stop and think like, oh, did we all know about which were C1s and 2s and so forth? Now, when talking about those controlled substance classes, of course, that's, you know, within the realm of healthcare, uh, but also these topics overlap with the streets as well. So here's another way of looking at grouping things, and this is based on therapeutic index. What the heck is that? Of course, therapeutic index, one way of putting it is the difference between what will hurt you and what will help you. Uh, the more wiggle room in between, or in this chart here, the larger the bar horizontally, the more wiggle room for dosing, the, the larger the therapeutic index. Now, we're not talking warfarin or levothyroxine or any of those NTIs here, narrow therapeutic index meds. Uh, here we're talking some other stuff as listed here. Uh, so again, the larger the bar, the, the in respect to therapeutic index, uh, the safer it is because of the, the wiggle room for, for dosing, if it's actually dosed, of course. Two sides to every coin, I'll cover them all for you. If anything stands out here for you by now as your eyes are navigating through, you're probably thinking down towards the bottom, what the heck is nutmeg doing on there? Yeah, it's actually a, uh, a meristicin, it's a, it's a hallucinogen, uh, but Mm, dosage matters too. You know, typically what's in our pantry isn't really going to put us into a Shakespeare play, right? 
Now, let's take a little trip back here to the controlled substance idea here. So, some famous opioids these days. Carfentanil, also known as wild nail. It has a morphine milligram equivalent. That's how the, the, the attempt to compare relative potency. It ain't perfect, folks. But what else we got as well? So, MME, relatively, it's 10,000. So, let's just say it's really up there, right? Fentanyl, however, is 100. Significantly less. I mean, two zeros less than carfentanil, right? Um, those are both C2s. Whereas heroin or diacetylmorphine has an MME, generally speaking, of three. It, there can be debate there, obviously, but three compared to 10,000. You, you have a C2 and a C1. Hmm. Two plus two equals one. What's going on here? It's kind of like thinking about alcohol, you know, uh, ethyl alcohol being legal, then illegal, then legal. We, we generally assume, or perhaps presume, as one should never assume, uh, that controlled substance classifications are very objective, right? What about alcohol? What about what you're looking at right now? So another way to put it, it's all about the dosage, baby. So father of toxicology, Paracelsus, uh, said, said it in Latin, of course, but uh, all things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose makes a thing, not a poison. Got some pictures here of things like apples, pears, potatoes, and the equivalent of a zucchini. Too much of those could end up being a poison. You'd have to eat a heck of a lot of them, right? Um, but it's all about the dosage. It's not just the substance. It's about the dosage, baby. And speaking about dosage, well, when the dose gets too high, who are you going to call? Ghost? No. The poison center. And how do we remember that? It's 1-800-ALL-2s with the one in the middle. It's a way that uh, I always uh, looked at it anyway, and it seems to help a lot of others. They, of course, have apps and online uh, tools and whatnot as well, but uh, we really, as healthcare professionals, and really anyone within society wants to have that number memorized, 1-800-222-1222. A little bit easier to roll off the tongue saying 1-800-ALL-2s with the one in the middle, because we know about the seven digits, right? All right, when talking about illicit substances, of course, one of the many things that comes up in a historical perspective is just say no. Mmm. During the 80s there, Reagan administration, certainly not going political here, it's just it's something that was profound within uh, our overall war on drugs as a country. Uh, but there was the Just Say No and O oh campaign. But you know what? Words matter. So let's dive a little deeper. And as I've learned in life, if you think words matter, well, spelling and typically grammar they matter really too, uh, kind of vital. Uh, so uh, those that don't know me, you might not know that, well, and I don't know why you would, but <laughs> I, I was in a seventh grade spelling bee, just like everybody else. Uh, and I actually got uh, booted out. Uh, here's some of the winners nationally, by the way, but I got booted out of a seventh grade spelling bee because we, they asked me to spell relief and I spelled R-O-L-A-I-D-S, Rolades. Now, I kid you not, I'm not making that up. It's not the moment in time where I thought, realized I was going to be a pharmacist. That was later. Uh, but I did that and literally no one laughed, uh, like not even the teachers. So I, I was like, oh my goodness, what's going on here? But the point here being spelling matters. So what kind of spelling matters here? Well, yeah, just say no. But K-N-O-W, just say no. Knowledge is power. That's what we're here for today. All right, now though, let's uh, let's have our first poll question. So, and we'll, we'll go light first here. What is the national phone number for the poison centers? Is it A one eight 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 two 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 one two two two, or B one eight hundred two 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 one two two two, or C one eight 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 one two 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 two, or D one eight hundred one two 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 two? That was a little rough, folks. I hope the answering is a little bit easier. And of course, the answer to our first poll question of what is the national phone number for poison centers is 1-800-ALL-2s with a one in the middle. All right, now the overall topic here for today is of course, just say no, K-N-O-W. So we got the root of that, but it's also a review of illicit substances. So let's uh, see what our plan of attack here is. So we're gonna go over three main groupings, the stimulants, hallucinogens, and sedatives. And here's the uh, the items that we're gonna go over within each of those. So for stimulants, we'll cover nicotine, amphetamines, meth, and cocaine. And for hallucinogens, we'll go over belladonna alkaloids, dissociative anesthetics, tryptamines, phenylethylamines, and piperazines. And for sedatives, we'll of course do opioids, gabapentinoids, cannabis, and alcohol. 
All right, first up is nicotine. Uh, the substance that's involved with, uh, of course, tobacco and then e-cigs and vaping and whatnot these days. Uh, but, you know, going to the core, um, tobacco in itself is uh, responsible for approximately a half a million deaths in a tobacco-related death sense every single year in our country. It just blows away other numbers like 100,000 for alcohol-related and, um, you know, about 70,000, what we had during COVID, 93,000 uh, drug-related over overdose deaths as well. So nicotine in itself, uh, what does it do? What's the mechanism? You now, earlier we were saying it's all about the dosage, but now it's also about what, what the substance does, how it works. So as you see here, nicotine stimulates the release of dopamine for the euphoria, glutamate for the memory, GABA to reduce anxiety, serotonin to improve the mood, norepinephrine for arousal, beta endorphin for reducing anxiety, just like with GABA, and Kind of last but not least, but first and foremost is acetylcholine for that arousal. That's the big thing. Now, what products uh, contain what amounts of nicotine? I provided a chart here for us of a general rundown. You know, probably want to go to the bottom first, but uh, cigarettes are, are known to contain between one and one and a half milligrams of nicotine in each cigarette. There's 20 cigs in a pack. Uh, so we need to know those kinds of things when we're talking about packs per day for uh, overall dosage per se. Uh, but then check out, uh, you know, the different jewel pods as far as uh, vaping and e-cigs and whatnot, um, or even those larger amounts of nicotine like uh, chew, you know, a, a little box, round box of chew. Uh, these are really important things. And as every U.S. Surgeon General has always said, if there's one thing we can do as healthcare professionals, it's help people with smoking cessation. Now, moving onward and amping it up to amphetamines, probably important just to go over some of the basics here as far as mechanism of action in theory. This was actually something that I ended up drawing on the board of a middle school once when uh, we were doing some uh, help out in the community and, and teaching uh, some middle schoolers all about uh, illicit substances or substances of abuse. Uh, so overall, when you're talking about amphetamines for the typical course of action for ADHD treatment, uh, it, it's taking someone who is at a hyperactive level, that's the middle dotted horizontal line here, and then increasing with amphetamine that those effects, getting to the point where the body just shuts down then and then goes back down into to, um, homeostasis per se. Whereas if someone's going down the route of non-medical use for amphetamines where with, without a diagnosis of ADD, ADHD, then you're going from a baseline homeostasis up to hyperactivity. And just a generality here, but perhaps could help all of us with explain these things to others in our community. Now, no talk about amphetamine is complete without talking about meth amphetamine. Meth, right? Uh, so it turns out it's actually a C2. It uh, could be available in any pharmacy, but I'm pretty sure it's not actually in many, if any, pharmacies. There's here and there, though. Uh, it's the brand name Dizoxin. Uh, it was FDA approved for ADHD and obesity, and it's, of course, a C2. Uh, kind of a tricky thing, but it's also available OTC or over-the-counter self-care. It's the Levo... Uh, stereoisomer of methamphetamine, so levomethamphetamine. The actual dose is to get to where somebody would be looking for that euphoria, that, that high, that uh, stimulant high, would be incredibly higher. So yes, it's over the counter. Uh, check out the name. It's actually spelled differently on the products. It uses the international nomenclature, which is aimed to be a little bit more confusing. Uh, but yes, meth, uh, one of the most widely utilized and known illicit substances in our country and planet for that matter, but it's also a C2 and over the counter. And we mentioned Breaking Bad earlier, so if you've seen it, here's Walter White, our high school chemistry teacher turned meth uh, lab expert. Uh, what he would tell me is, Mark, you mean to me tell me that uh, pure meth is already readily available as a legal prescription medicine? You simply got to be kidding me, because he spent six seasons of a show making, in a fake way, obviously, it's just drama, um, uh, making meth, whereas, you know, we in healthcare could have done it in one episode. It's already available as a prescription product. But that being said, um, you know, wh what's going on with the Walter White era here uh, or just in general for where meth amphetamine meth uh, has been coming from? So early on, we had the reduction. Uh, we're getting out of row chem here, folks, but a reduction methods of uh, the old shake and bake is reductive amination. Um, that was uh, that, that was, of course, the one way. Uh, we also have the other reduction methods here, Birch, Nazi and uh, Nagai. But putting those together, so back in the day, it was made on a larger level by uh, P2P was the precursor. Uh, then internationally, but especially in our country, we cracked down on P2P, pun intended. Uh, and that's where smurfing came along. 
Uh, those familiar with the map in the middle here, this is the uh, regulations for purchase of pseudoephedrine in pharmacies or anywhere for that matter uh, across our country. Uh, so we cracked down on the pseudoephedrine version, the smurfing as it was called. Um, and then the streets reacted by saying, all right, fine, we'll just create the precursor to the precursor. So the precursor to P2P, uh, this stuff is manufactured over in Asia all the time now. It is incredibly cheap to make and ship. Uh, so have we really been winning this war on meth? Well, it's only gotten worse. And was the crackdown on it part of the reasoning for that? Well, it's part of the story, of course. Uh, but that's why uh, perhaps in my state, maybe your state too, somebody could buy, you know, five bags of heroin on the street, get a sixth free, and then also throw in a bag of meth because it's so incredibly cheap to make and ship. All right, enough about meth, right? We'll leave Walter alone for now. Cocaine, let's move on to that. So a couple uh, terminology things here we want to know. But uh, first off, of course, it's a C2. It's actually in the WHO list of uh, medicines that should be in every hospital known to mankind on the globe. Um, another way of putting it, of course. But what, what about the dosage? It's always about the dosage, right? So cocaine, the salt, uh, that that's uh, what we see here towards the top. Uh, that it's always going to be typically snorted in lines. Now, that doesn't tell you the dose. That's just the formulation, per se. The dose is uh, where it becomes known as bumps. That's a smaller amount. Obviously, just approximate, but about 35 milligrams, give or take a lot, uh, compared to rails. That's the larger amount, give or take a lot of 100 milligrams. Uh, how can you remember that? Well, and this could come up in conversations with patients. That's, that's the point here, so knowing what's going on, because we need to know what substances and what dose, if we can. Uh, bumps are like speed bumps. They're annoying, but they do help, uh, whereas rails... That's the big choo-choos that go across the whole country that my kid loves to look at, right? Uh, so that's the difference in doses there. There's also the free base formulation of cocaine, and we're all familiar with that as crack or ice. Uh, where does it get the name crack? Well, when you burn the thing, it snap, crackle, pops. So they get all the crack. But the free base is basically cocaine plus baking soda, uh, made in kitchens everywhere across our country. How does cocaine work? All the above. Uh, selective serotonin antagonist, dopamine reuptake inhibitor, sodium channel blocker, uh, MMDA, and norepinephrine along the way. All right, so that uh, concludes our stimulants conversation there. I know it was quick, but we're covering a lot here today and respecting your time. So hallucinogens, here's how I organize hallucinogens. This isn't necessarily something that you see in every textbook. I don't even know if you'll see it in any textbooks, actually. But it's a way for us healthcare professionals to wrap our heads around these things. So we're grouping them, uh, as we mentioned earlier, as belladonna alkaloids. We have nightshade, mandrake, group. Jimson weed, then the dissociative anesthetics like Special K, PCP, and Mexi, the tryptamines, which are serotonin-like. You've got your, um, you know, LSD, psilocybin, DMT, uh, it's dimethyltryptamine, and various uh, analogs of DMT, um, and all the way down to ayahuasca, and so forth. And then we have the phenethylamines, and those are dopamine-like. Things like bromo dragonfly, mescaline 2CB, NBOB, nutmeg, mentioned that earlier, substitute amphetamines like our MDMA and whatnot, and cathinones like gravel and, and, um, and bath salts. Oh, and bupropion as well, too, but that's actually prescription. And finally, the paparazines, you know, as listed here as the benzyl and phenyl groups. All right, so for hallucinogens, we're going to stay big picture here, but a very important thing covering mechanisms. Uh, we're going to compare these things relatively to atypical antipsychotics. Uh, so first-generation atypical antipsychotics work as dopamine antagonist, as I'm attempting to portray here on the left. And then our second-generation atypical antipsychotics work as both dopamine and serotonin, selectively, of course. Whereas hallucinogens generally work as agonists, so the exact opposite of second-generation atypical antipsychotics. Exactly opposite, but same area for the mechanism. So food for thought for us understanding these things, of course. Now, what's one of the biggest concerns overall, really big picture, of course, with hallucinogens is, well, are people actually aiming to get serotonin syndrome when there's the abuse of hallucinogens? Well, in a way, kind of, um, you know, one of the things we bring up, especially in, within the profession of pharmacy, we're always discussing things like serotonin syndrome for drug-drug interactions. And it's really important, of course. Uh, but 
you know, in general, the symptoms, the effects is kind of similar to opioid withdrawal, um, you know, the for the effects of some hallucinogens, things like XD and C and whatnot. But serotonin syndrome, I have the laundry list here of the uh, symptoms, as we all well know, of course. But, you know, how do we go about it well, when, when talking about it in the realm of general drug-drug interactions or anything? You can always tell patients, well, if you feel bad on a Friday, kind of like you have the flu, don't wait till Monday to tell somebody, um, you know, just to make sure. That way it escalates things, but it doesn't escalate it to huge, you know, concerns or worries, uh, especially if there's a psychological medicine involved in the first place. But in one way of thinking, based on those mechanisms of actions we just went over, uh, it's kind of like when people are utilizing hallucinogens uh, in the streets, per se, it's kind of like they're looking to get serotonin syndrome. All right, so onward to opioids. Yep, every headline every day. So uh, just the, here's the opioid crisis rolling tides, the different waves. So currently we're, we're said to be in wave three, but things started out with an increase in uh, prescription opioid overdose deaths. Um, We'll have a little bit more on that in a moment here. And then around the the year of, say, about 2010 or so, the, towards the end of what is referred to as wave two, so kind of makes one wonder, is it really just two waves? But anyways, as depicted here in many other places, it's um, wave two is when uh, the rise in heroin or diacetylmorphine, and then wave three is when we saw, of course, the rise in fentanyl, fentanyl analogs, and various other synthetic opioids as adulterants or additives to heroin. Uh, and that's where we lie today when it comes to the opioid crisis. Now, there's no time then, uh, especially during a pandemic or any time, to uh, remember that we got to read the articles, folks. You know, we're not talking about magazines or anything here, but we got to read the articles. It's not just the headlines. Uh, this article from MMWR uh, from you know back in the day, give or take five years ago or so, uh, is actually what where the core of the idea, the headlines that say 75% of heroin utilizers started with prescription opioids, and Based on this report here, that's true. But what about the gut check to us healthcare professionals when we take the kidney punches each and every day about, well, did they come directly from us or whatnot? The looming question is, where did they get them? That's not addressed in this. You know, was it from family, friends, diverted for free, whatever, or did it, they come directly from patient provider relationships in healthcare? Well, it demands a little bit more looking, of course. And where do we look? None other than some of the DEA reports that come out every year. So here is the information from one of those reports that shows that uh, actually it's just about a third of the time that's coming from healthcare, give or take, but a third. The two thirds approximately is from friends, relatives, whether it's free, paying for, drug dealer, whatnot, a little tiny bit of uh, multiple prescribers as well. But relatively speaking, it's only one third of the time coming from the general healthcare legal system. Eye opening. And an extrapolation going a little bit further is, well, why would people be going down this non-medical use route or substance abuse route? Uh, well, it's uh, not very often that it's actually for euphoria. As I've highlighted here, uh, the euphoria are getting high in this study, again from a DEA report, uh, was only about 13% of the time. The other times were times where we're actually supposed to be in charge as healthcare professionals working with our patients to help them with their pain, anxiety, sleep, and emotions. Again, kind of eye-opening. Now, since we're talking about headlines, here's here's some other information, okay? Now, what I always strive for is not being biased and not giving opinions, but giving all sides of the coin. That's where we're going right now. We always have to look at numbers and percentages. Now, here I have a title versus, but it's actually the point is that it's and. So we in the United States of America are known to lead the globe when it comes to overdose deaths and all the tragedies that come from that. But when you look at other countries, the the data does emphasize that. But there are certain countries, as I've highlighted here with Estonia, now obviously an incredibly smaller population. I mean, undoubtedly and obviously. But when you look at the percentage, this is what's not covered. You know, when it comes to the research that's out there, I added the two columns that are to the right. So you would only just see typically the overdose numbers and that's it. But what about is the percentage of the population? I mean, our country is incredibly larger than the population of Estonia. So, of course, overdose deaths would be expected to be incredibly larger as well, too. So when you look at what I've highlighted here, the drug overdose population percentage, now we're getting back into the ballparks of at least a little bit of a similarity there. Now, again, the, the point here is that what was shared was the numbers, but what wasn't shared in the information that's available out there in the world was the percentages. And we got to look at both. 
Now, conversely here, we got to look the other way, too. Here's uh, where we're typically talking about uh, percentages, but then we got to think about the numbers. So opposite of what we just talked about. So we we all fluently know from lots of headlines and information and data that's out there that uh, my wild and wonderful state of West Virginia is the ground zero of the opioid crisis based on these overdose rates, obviously much larger by leaps and bounds than other states. But we got to take that percentage, maybe multiply it out by the population because my state also has a very low population. It's not Estonia, but it, you know we are one of the states. And when you look at the overdose numbers, all of a sudden there's a not really a different story, but something that should catch eyes. Because what we're talking about here is not just, you know, uh, substances that are attained within the healthcare system. It's also within the illicit or illegal uh, drug supply chain in the streets as well, too. So basically, when a drug dealer is on a bus uh, taking, uh, you know, heroin from one state, we'll say Ohio, down to West Virginia, uh, if he gets off the bus in West Virginia and there's overdose deaths from that uh, laced product that has carfentanil in it, um, that's going to affect the percentages a lot more than if he had gotten off the bus in Ohio. And that story is actually what happened a couple of years ago in Huntington, West Virginia, with about a little bit more than two dozen overdoses uh, within four hours. Uh, I came from that. So we got to think about these things where, you know, if we're known as the ground zero, and certainly, uh, you know, appropriately based on the percentages of the overdose rate, check out the numbers, though, compared to Ohio and Pennsylvania, like one fifth approximately. And when you're talking about human heartbeats, that's important to consider. So it's all about percentages and numbers. All right, let's uh, pop in our second poll question here. Which of the following substances is a C2? A, cannabis, B, LSD, C, methamphetamine, or D, tramadol? And of course, our answer to the second poll question of which of the following substances is a C2 is C, methamphetamine. All right, continuing our discussion here on the opioid side of the world when it comes to just say no, uh, we got to think a really big important question here. Where is opioid supply? Where are they coming from? Now, we fluently typically in society know that on the illicit side, a lot of opioids, heroin, uh, and whatnot are coming from Mexico, and now we're getting a lot of analogs from uh, you know across the pond elsewhere as, as well, and that's contributing to that natural source there with the poppy. But what about the natural opioids for our semi-synthetic opioids that we manufacture it for prescription products? Where do they come from? I mean, these things have to be grown somewhere, right? Well, lo and behold, I got that question and had to answer it with an International Narcotics Control Board report. Comes out every year. Uh, in Australia, Spain, and France are the lead the world, the entire globe, in opium um, growth and you know farming and development. Um, even more so, typically, from reports that we see observational uh, across the globe, uh, than than the illicit side. So that's an important thing to consider. That there's actually more grown for the prescription side, and here's where they're coming from uh, as compared to the illicit side. So just how are folks making heroin across the globe? Um, well, there's the uh, prescription version that's done in manufacturing plants in certain countries where it's illegal. Uh, and then there's what's done in the mountains of everywhere, right? Uh, you start out with the Freddy Krueger style knife device. You picture that uh, on your hand with multiple knives. Uh, and two weeks after the opium um, flowers, uh, you'll have that bulb that's there and you get the ooze that's out of there. Then you extract the morphine out of that ooze. And then you double acetylate that morphine to make diacetylmorphine base. And then you make that base a salt. And that's where we get heroin that is distributed across the globe. Now, conversely, there's also the idea, of course, of prescription opioid overdose deaths. You know, remember back when we had talked about the individual substances that contribute to the uh, drug overdose deaths in our country a year. Here's honing in just on prescription opioids. Now, again, this isn't talking about the source. It's talking about the outcome. Um, you know, thinking back, it's, it's you know, the, as healthcare professionals, we're not always, um, hardly ever actually, uh, involved in the direct supply, but we often, if not always, are involved indirectly uh, because uh, it comes down to what our patient ends up doing or has done to them uh, for their prescription opioid supply. You know, theft happens, I go over storage and disposal at all times. 
uh, with our patients. If you're only going to pick one, of course, going over storage, avoiding medicine cabinets and whatnot. But as we see here, they're, in, they're rising in the early, uh, you know, the first decade of this century we're in. And then it continues today to have issues with prescription opioid overdose deaths. Now, one of the more funkier um, opioids to, issues to talk about is robo-tripping. So what do we got going on with that? Well, dextromethorphan. It's actually the uh, methylated um, right-handed version of levorphanol, a relatively potent opioid. It has an MME of 11. Uh, but you, you just change it twice like that with a mirror image and a methyl group, and all of a sudden you have dextromethorphan. And that's why if you look at uh, in not just pharmacies and grocery stores and, and dollar stores, but you can look in hotel gift shops, you will almost always, uh, depending on where you are, uh, see the little uh, three-ounce bottle of dextromethorphan to help with coughs. Well, robo-tripping is when somebody utilizes the entire bottle at once. They get the cough suppression, the pain management, and also the stimulation, hallucinations, and distorted vision along the way. And that's robo-tripping, readily available in these bottles. And we need to know that uh, when we're helping our patients with cough and cold uh, and keeping a lookout for what's going on in our pharmacy house as well. Now, how do we combat uh, opiate overdoses? Great question, of course. And what comes to the table is naloxone. Now, here's a chart that I put together to hopefully wrap our heads around what we need to know as healthcare professionals for the differences in naloxone products. You know, first we have the injectables. Uh, then we have the generic intranasal kits, the manual kits that you put together. And then we have now uh, basically two versions of the uh, prepackaged uh, uh, naloxone for nasal sprays. You have the Narcan that's also available, generic nasal spray, and then we have Cloxido. Uh, the difference is in the dose there, the Narcan and generic being four milligrams in one nostril. So one spray, one nostril, you get four milligrams, whereas the newer version, uh, Cloxido, gets eight milligrams in one nostril. As compared to the generic manual kit that you put together, that would be one milligram in each nostril for a total of two milligrams. So you can see how the dosages have escalated recently, uh, but as a counseling point, that's really important to talk about the product that's already put together is one nostril, wait two or three minutes after having called 911, um, and then um, you know, could redose if need be. Whereas the manual kit that you put together, you gotta do in both nostrils. Of note, the Evzio auto injector was discontinued in October of 2020. That was the talking little device for injection. Now let's cover some of the, the dosing pearls or clinical pearls here for naloxone. So first off, do we know the offending opioids dose that cause the respiratory depression? More often than uh, ever, not. Uh, how many doses are, are enough for naloxone or how many revivals? Here you see to the right here, it's just something I pulled from social media where this uh, gentleman, Ken, was revived 15 times. What if there was a maximum of two or three? He literally would not be with us. Uh, is a, a patient, a person utilizing buprenorphine uh, for medication assisted treatment and then has an overdose and needs naloxone? Would there be more naloxone needed? Well, the mu affinity for buprenorphine is through the roof compared to naloxone. Um, what about polysubstance abuse? Well, it's not typically just opioids. It's opioids and benzos or opioids and a stimulant even. There's a lot of things that are uh, observed to be utilized and abused not just an opioid. What's the setting? It was uh, somebody uh, in a rural setting away from a hospital, or is it in a metropolis, or you know, where's the ambulance going? Uh, what about the expiration date for the products? Uh, here, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, C.K. Babcock, has a, a study that got featured actually on CNN that talked about how the expiration date, because we have millions and millions of dollars in grants paying for naloxone to be provided everywhere, and then it expires. And if it's not utilized, well, then what? Uh, so they found that uh, it actually will last longer. You can look there for more information, of course, for the specifics. And then, of course, just like a real estate agent, location, location, location. Uh, not only do we need to have conversations with our patients regarding naloxone education for those utilizing you know, opioids and whatnot, but also uh, let's put it next to the defibrillators in malls, libraries, airplanes, everywhere. And then there's the infamous Narcan party myth. Oh, people are having Narcan parties, right? Well. The idea there um, uh, would be that people would be utilizing uh, and, or abusing an opioid, say heroin, injecting it, knowing that they might overdose. And when they overdose, well, they have Narcan there, so you know everything's safe, they won't die. Well, yeah, but then Narcan or naloxone is going to be inducing withdrawal. And the whole point initially was to avoid withdrawal for that abuse of heroin. So it's counterintuitive there. So points to ponder, of course. All right, next up in sedatives, we have gabapentinoids, obviously including gabapentin, um, which is, you know, uh, mimicking along the way for GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. Then we have pregabalin, 
It's relatively more potent than gabapentin. Most would say you could go by a factor of six for comparative dosages, but it's really relative along the way. Uh, it does have a faster onset than gabapentin as well. And then there's the quote-unquote muscle relax. We've got a loop in here as well too, baclofen. It's actually a structural analog of GABA, as you can hopefully see here when we're making med kind of fun here. Um, and big picture, GABA. The GABA system inhibits pain processing. Uh, it's the same area where things like benzos, we'll touch on here in a moment, alcohol, some seizure medicines, and so forth, and a lot of substances abuse have their effects within this GABA area of the neurons. So speaking of benzos, uh, here's just a quick, really reference chart, um, not, not as conversational, but more of a reference chart for how to group benzodiazepines. We have our long actings to the top, intermediate, and then short acting. And then there's also a comparative oral dose. Now we're not going along the lines of morphine milligram equivalents, or in this case, uh, benzo milligram equivalents. It's not that necessarily, but it's just comparative doses along the way. Uh, really important to keep in mind the whole long acting idea, especially for elderly patients. And then the concept of these being utilized in the streets alongside polysubstance abuse, alongside other uh, products such as opioids and stimulants and hallucinogens alike. All right, last but not least, as far as our substances of abuse, cannabis plants. Okay, first off, you know, we're, we're pharmacy professionals. We're not necessarily botanists or farmers, um, unless you spell the farmers with the pH, right? But we do need to understand the differences here and, um, and to be able to educate our communities and our fellow healthcare professionals. But that's a plant that we could go through the nomenclature here of how we uh, classify all plants of the plant egg kingdom. But if you go down to genus and species, that's where it really gets real. Cannabis is the genus for all, all things hemp, marijuana, cannabis, CBD, THC, you name it, terminology up the, uh, up, up everywhere. Uh, and then the species is where it changes. So here on the left, we have cannabis sativa. When you're looking towards the right here, the cannabis sativa, that's typically the taller plants. And that's where we're typically thinking in its core, more of the CBD cannabidiol products. Whereas we have indica, there you're thinking the leaves like you saw in the 1990s Dr. Dre label, Chronic, uh, that's where typically at its core, there's a higher concentration of THC. That being said, there's a lot of hybrids out there these days, folks. It's just like tomatoes. You got your aromas, you got your beef steaks, and you got everything in between for hybrids. We do have to remember that. But in the end, it's all about cannabis, not all of these other terms, just different species of them. All right, so in reality, especially as healthcare professionals, what's our concerns for cannabinoids and cannabis? Uh, well, first off, there's the thing known as uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. That's where somebody is taking like a dozen hot showers a day uh, just uh, to, to try and help with all the vomiting, nausea and vomiting uh, like crazy. Uh, then we got to think about if something is uh, combustible or smoked. Uh, carcinogens are certainly high. Here's a depiction of uh, marijuana lung compared to tobacco lung. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, there's the, the age old idea with the gateway drug theory, you know, two sides to every coin though. Uh, here is, on the right is a chart that's showing that conversely here, they, they are opposites. If there's a perception of risk, the utilization is lower. Uh, for 12th grade students here anyway in this study. So every time the perception went up, utilization went down and vice versa. Uh, and of note, marijuana use coincides with alcohol use, not one or the other. In fact, there's even the THC uh, or cannabis marijuana uh, breathalyzer that's in development as well. So one or two things that we as healthcare professionals absolutely need to know is what about drug interactions? And metabolism comes into play here for cannabinoids. So I'm trying to uh, simplify it all down here to one simple chart, but CBD and THC. Here's the CYP450 enzymes that are involved in the metabolism for CBD and THC and what the effects of CBD and THC are on those. So. Of note here, you have things of 1A2, 2C9, 2C19, 3A4, and 2D6. Can you think of any drug interactions that would happen with any medications with these two products based on these? Mm-hmm. Heck, even just look at 3A4, right? That's going to take care of a lot of prescription medicines that we as healthcare professionals need to be considerate of. Uh, now, how do we do drug interaction checks? We could utilize even the prescription cannabinoid products that are FDA approved, like your Epidiolex for CBD, uh, Marinol, Dronabinol for THC. And you can always do uh, drug interaction checks in that manner. But lo and behold, this is where we come in to have first ask the questions of what someone's utilizing and then what we do as healthcare professionals to help that patient. All right, one last thing on uh, putting together uh, cannabis and opioids. Uh, there are a lot of headlines out there that are always talking about when, quote-unquote, medical marijuana is legalized in the state, then prescription opioid utilization decreases. 
but is that the actual question? Here we see how when quote unquote medical marijuana is legalized in states, then we see opioid overdose deaths increase. Huh, need to see that in the headlines too. Now, other side of the coin, always like to give all the sides. So yes, less opioids, but more opioid overdoses, but is correlation the same as causation? Or is there a lot of other stuff going on in the world at the same time, particularly our country, right? So you can't link them directly together, but do want to dispel some of the, the media headlines that are out there. All right, so that generally wraps up our conversation here on stimulants, hallucinogens, and sedatives as illicit substances. So where do we go from here? Well, here uh, I alluded to this earlier, but in the conversation, but uh, we got to remember the big picture here. You know, drugs uh, have approximately 70,000. It was 93,000 during COVID times early on uh, for U.S. annual overdose deaths. Alcohol-related deaths are 100,000. Tobacco-related deaths are 500,000. We have a lot going on. This whole illicit substance uh, situation is, is only part of the pie overall where we as healthcare professionals can hopefully help our patients uh, when it comes to all the information like we cover today here in this conversation. But bigger picture here, you know, uh, the subjective objective battle here of legality really comes into play. And when we're talking about legality, whether we're talking decriminalization or if something's illegal or if it's completely legal or whatnot, uh, Nora Volkow has a, a really good set of uh, words here that she had said. Um, and, and for once, I'm actually just going to read some stuff for us here. But she said that repeated marijuana use during adolescence may result in long lasting changes in brain function that can jeopardize educational, professional and social achievements. Long lasting effects, folks. However, the effects of a drug, whether legal or illegal, on individual health are determined not only by its pharmacological properties, so we're thinking mechanism and dose here, uh, but also by its availability and social acceptability. Uh-oh, last slide on alcohol and tobacco, right? In this respect, legal drugs, alcohol and tobacco, offer a sobering, sobering perspective, accounting for the greatest burden of disease associated with drugs, not because they are more dangerous than illegal drugs, but because their legal status allows for more widespread exposure. And we really need to think about that in our country and across the whole globe these days. And what better picture of legal versus illegal across the globe than diacetylmorphine heroin? Here's actually the package insert, half of it. It's only half, but um, and from the United Kingdom for heroin, diacetylmorphine. Package insert. It's uh, legal. It's dosed. Great package insert. It's not negative 15 font, and, well, it's concise. It's not that thing that rolls out like crazy receipts, right? Um, but just food for thought. Mechanism, dose, and availability. And by golly, when we're in this uh, drug crisis in our country and across the whole globe, uh, there's a lot of fingers being pointed. The tag you're it here. This is uh, what I've tried to portray is who's involved in the drug supply chain overall. Literally everyone that's involved. Having a, a, a piece of the boat. We're trying to keep the boat afloat and help our patients as healthcare professionals. So on purpose, this kind of looks like a boat or maybe one of those party hats, right? But the intention is a boat. Uh, and here's everyone that's involved. Literally everyone. I'll let your eyes navigate through the things here, but who's at the top? Patients as well. It's not just us as healthcare professionals. It's not just the legislative side. It's not the criminal justice side. Uh, it's not just manufacturers, distributors, insurance companies, and so on and so forth. The patients are involved too. It's all of us keeping this boat afloat. And then just how do we help people, helping our patients as healthcare professionals? Well, here on the left, we have some general public resources like SAMHSA, Veterans Line, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, Narnon for family and friends of uh, those utilizing substances of abuse, and then even local organizations. Uh, check out in your local area, perhaps your county, your city, your state, most likely. Uh, I know in West Virginia, we have this 1844 Help for West Virginia. Uh, you call in a human answers. Uh, it's amazing for a call center, quite frankly, uh, run by the folks at 1-800-GAMBLER, I believe, or modeled after it at least. And, um, you know, check out those things in your local area, but here's some national ones as well. And then just like when you're on an airplane, when they tell you, you got to put your mask on first before you help somebody else with theirs, right? Uh, we got to help ourselves here as healthcare professionals. And there we have boards of pharmacy. We have the pharmacist recovery networks or the PRN, uh, the national website. I believe Charlie Broussard still runs that uh, to have the information available for everyone across the country. And, you know, what's a typical substance use disorder treatment going to look like? Well, the best of the best care for us healthcare professionals in need. Uh, but the overall idea here is that, you know, just like on that last slide with uh, keeping the boat afloat, we got to help each other out. All right. So wrapping up our discussion here today, a couple key takeaways. Of course, poison centers, 
all twos with the one in the middle. Uh, controlled substance classes include C1s like heroin, LSD, marijuana, MDMA, and PCP. C2s of cocaine, meth, and fentanyl. C3 is special K. C4 benzos. C5 pro meth with codeine. Now, common illicit substance groups include stimulants, such as nicotine, amphetamines, meth, and cocaine, hallucinogens, as we reviewed earlier, and sedatives, including opioids, gabapentinoids, cannabis, and alcohol. Uh, nicotine stimulates the re release of many neurotransmitters with particular attention to acetylcholine, and illicit hallucinogens typically function as agonists for dopamine and serotonin receptors, uh, selectively, uh, which is the exact opposite of second-generation atypical antipsychotic medications. And naloxone nasal spray manual kits require administration of both nostrils initially, while pre-packaged products require initial dosage in only one nostril. And CBD and THC can cannabinoids are involved with the CYP450 enzyme system via 1A2, 2C9, 2C19, 3A4, and 2D6. A lot of them. And I just wanted to leave everyone with a couple resources, a good amount of them actually, for where to go for more information on illicit substances. There's a lot of uh, annual DEA reports, international reports, we're all drug reports. Uh, you could actually even uh, European drug reports too. There's a lot of these annual reports across the globe. And of course, bottom right here, we have some online blogs where you can't believe everything you read, but interesting to check some of those out like Blue Light and so on. And last but not least, if you remember back to our early discussion, um, on average in our country, uh, an American dies every seven minutes of a drug overdose. So here's the seven heartbeats during this conversation today for the human heartbeats that were lost, statistically speaking, over that time. And again, remember, it's actually every six minutes for during COVID time numbers with the preliminary numbers being 93,000 overdose deaths. Staggering and eye-opening. So I really want to thank you for your time here today and look forward to a dynamic question and answer session as well, too, uh, to really make an impact, to save and help those heartbeats uh, when it comes to, as we talked about here today, just say no, spelling matters, our review of illicit substances. Thank you all for participating in today's live webinar. If you haven't already, please go ahead and enter your questions or comments into the chat box now, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible in the remaining time available. At this time, you'll find the link to the core survey in the chat window. As a reminder, you will need to complete this survey to have your participation reported to CPE Monitor and to CE Broker. Please make sure to take note of the four digit code displayed on the screen now as you will need it to complete the survey. All right, welcome back everyone for our live Q&A. It's a little bit of a short one here today, but no worries, uh, we covered a lot already, right? Uh, so, well, first off, the in case folks missed it, the uh, attendance code, you know, the, the important thing is uh, 6019. So again, this attendance code is 6019. Happy holidays, everybody. Uh, lots of stuff we went over here today. So uh, keep the questions and comments coming in. No worries on comments, keep them coming too, of course. So. Um, in the big picture, uh, two ways for everybody to keep in touch, by the way, I got a couple updates here as well, but two ways to keep in touch, uh, LinkedIn, if we're not connected on LinkedIn, feel free to connect on there, or even feel free to message if you'd like. I actually had a post, uh, I think I uh, scheduled it for this morning, um, po uh, posing a question to you, our clinicians, our experts. So, uh, check that out. Uh, you can also check out painguy.us. I got the, uh, trademark on pain guy. You go to the website, P-A-I-N-G-U-Y dot U-S, because, hey, we're in America, right? Also, dot com was too too expensive. But anyways, uh, LinkedIn and PingGuy dot U-S, check them out. I got lots of uh, headlines and resources on the website. You could actually contact me directly. It literally comes to me, not some third world country. I, I more and more get uh, folks uh, reaching out with uh, keeping in touch, of course, too. All right, so uh, one update I wanted to share with everybody. Uh, earlier in the presentation, I uh, talked about how um, an American dies every so many minutes uh, from a drug overdose overall. Uh, it's now six minutes. 
uh, that has uh, uh, been increased. Of course, we're at about a, a little bit over 110 um, overdose deaths. It's all drugs uh, here uh, in our country per year. Also, I got word from the DEA, the uh, updated numbers that they have for the confiscated drugs, the illegal stuff, okay? Um, uh, seven out of 10 products, pills, are containing a lethal dose of fentanyl. Uh, so that's, that's, that's staggering, right? That means when people have little moments, little decisions, there's huge consequences for whether to utilize a drug or not in any scenario. By the way, it's not doom and gloom. It's just a reality of our drug supply these days. It's not like it was 50 years ago, okay? Um, and again, those little moments, those are things we could talk about with our family, friends, everybody uh, during these holiday gatherings and all that too, okay? All right, I got a thought here on uh, xylazine. I'm going to paraphrase to say uh, the question would be, uh, what's up with xylazine? So xylazine is not an opioid, but it is uh, now... Um, Every state has uh, some of it sprinkled into its heroin supply, which, by the way, is typically fentanyl, not really heroin anymore. Uh, xylazine is basically like a cousin, a structural analog, a cousin of clonidine. So naloxone does not work on xylazine because it's not an opioid. Uh, it's not an opioid mean receptor agonist. So it's you know, an opioid um, uh, antagonist isn't going to have anything to do with that, too. So, all right. Um, that's just, you know. Things to keep in mind, because uh, a lot of folks are asking about that here, too. Uh, let's see, Stephanie saying, this is a really great session. Well, thank you. Uh, very informative and straightforward, and I appreciate that you gave an overarching review of the main classes and also kept the facts. Thank you so much. Happy holidays. Right back at you, Stephanie, and to everybody else as well, too. Uh, one thing you'll notice with Pain Guy here is, uh, yeah, unless I mess up, you're not getting an opinion. Sorry. Not sorry. Uh, you can get the facts. You figure out your own personal facts, okay? That's what my one sister-in-law calls uh opinions to call them personal facts all right uh let's see are there long-term implications i think that might have been a follow-up but things are scrolling um so we'll say for drug utilization there could be acute concerns like we talked about with that staggering number from the dea now by the way uh, when they say oh seven out of ten pills confiscated have a lethal amount of fentanyl that's what's confiscated it's not what's in the actual like supply because it's been confiscated so i keep that in mind as well too so uh it could be worse could be better could be Hey, in the end, though, uh, it's what we got to teach uh, all of our, our, particularly our youth, uh, but all of our society as well, too. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, we got like uh, 30 seconds here. Rachel's saying, do you have any tips for approaching conversations about illicit drug use, abuse with patients? Yeah, sure. I'll just bring it up. First off, you got to get comfy. So conversations like this on the professional side, million to one conferences out there, too, you could attend. Uh, hope to see you at, at any of them uh, when our foot pads cross. We get comfy, and then we can make it comfy for our patients, for our family, for our friends, for our community members, all that stuff, too. But just ask. Uh, I'll never forget. There was this one gentleman I had a phone call with doing an MTM over the phone and asking all of his medicines, OTC supplements, all that. And I was like, hey, anything else, you know, that might have a different uh, cost associated with or anything like that? And he's like, he started laughing. He's like, Sonny, I smoke up every day that ends in Y. His tone told me that he's been waiting for someone to ask. We just got to ask. We just start there, of course, and have the compassion and care in the background. All right, folks, we're actually out of time. So LinkedIn, painguy.us, connect. Have a wonderful, happy holidays. And as always, I uh, wish you a great day every day.